Hey movie junkies, welcome back to Twin Flicks, where we always here celebrating the magic of movies with you, and today is absolutely no exception. This interview today is one that Simon and I have both been anxiously waiting for, and finally our schedules aligned and we were able to sit down with film composer and music producer Simon Franklin. We dove in and talked a lot about his newest uh, score for Avatar The Way of Water. So he talked a lot about that score, what it was like working with James Cameron. I mean, this was a really fun interview as he really dove into his wide and prolific career, not just as a, a film composer, but also his career as a music producer, working with all the greats, having over, uh, I think he said around 400 producing credits from all the top artists. It was a blast hearing about all his uh, different experiences and his wealth of knowledge and what led to his transition from becoming a music producer, producing all these A-list music uh, artists, to composing film scores. So without further ado, here is our conversation with our friend, film composer, music producer, Simon Franklin. Uh, nice to finally meet you, uh, me and my twin brother Paul. We've been following your career for, for quite a few years now. Uh, first noticed your uh, credit on uh, Titanic, of course, and just uh, been following you, your music career, and so forth. First of all, I just want to say congratulations on Avatar: The Way of Water premieres uh, tomorrow worldwide. And uh, I just got to say, uh, I was able to listen to the score, previous score, a couple days ago and just could not stop listening to it i just i loved it just listening to it all day all night and and uh, there's a couple tracks that i just really really enjoyed i i'm um my brother and i were big percussion fans so we really love hearing the drums and percussions and and your work and you know you can definitely hear some James Horner influence there, and then of course your own style. Uh, I'll, take, I'll, I'll say thank you very much indeed. It's been a, a labor of love. It's been a labor as well. Obviously, there's been several years work and a whole year just on the yeah. on getting the score finished. But I, I'm very proud of it, uh, um, and I think that uh, it, I, you know, you, a lot of people would say, "Well, it's very easy because you're working with this exquisite, you know, story and imagery from Jim." Um, but he is. Um, he knows, you know, he challenges us all to, to do great work and to do our best that we can. And he will push and push until it's the way that he wants it. So I think as much as anything, you also you hear Jim Cameron in the score. You hear what he wants in terms of his film. Uh, you said I, I was following you on uh, Facebook and see some of the po pictures that you posted. And uh, yeah. I guess... You said that you, that you have somewhere around like five hours worth of music for for this. Is that correct? I'll give you a quick. Here, here's because they just arrived. So these are that is the score right now. <laughs> Two volumes. Wow. Now, normally you'd get about that's probably a score is normally about this much here. So this is considerably more um, and um, uh, yeah, I, there's a lot of stuff there. Now, did, did you work on this during COVID? Well, we were, obviously everything was going to happen earlier, sooner, but obviously the, the lockdown in 2020 did change a lot of things. Um, but then uh, when I came down to New Zealand to work with Jim, Jim said, you know, you need to be here with me. And they built me studios uh, in, the, uh, in the same block as his edit uh, suites. And the idea was that he would wander down the hall and we would uh, work together. We would collaborate. And that start, that was how it, it was at the beginning. And then somewhere in the, uh, a few weeks in, New Zealand went into an orange alert, which was that we all had to isolate where possible. And the big fear was that the whole production might close down because if we were all interacting with each other, because I have my music team, there's the film editorial, there's the sound design, there's um, capture, there's you know, there's all these various different people. There's Weta, 
Imagine that everybody started you know, infecting everybody else and we suddenly all went down. We might lose six weeks of work. Now, given the fact that we actually delivered the film on the uh, December the 1st, I think, is when the final print got sent out for the premiere, um, you can see that if we had lost even two weeks, we wouldn't have actually made uh, the delivery date. So that was a big problem. And the only way to solve that was for us to go into work bubbles so that if any one bubble went down, it wouldn't stop the whole film production. Um, I went into a bubble with three other people. Uh, I actually sort of lived my version of severance. Um, and we all, uh, I saw these three other people for close to six months. I would uh, wake up in the morning, I would cycle around the Wellington Bay, uh, go to my studio, I would work in my studio, and then I would see three other people, then I would cycle home, and that would be my daily occurrence for several months. Um, until July, I think, was the first time that I actually saw Jim again in purpose, in person, when we went to uh, LA to do the first scoring. Um, and we were Zooming beforehand, but it would be the strangest thing of having, hearing Jim through the door and then having a half second delay to hearing him through the Zoom link. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting way of working. Yeah, I, I talked to uh, several people who've worked similar, similar same way, directors and composers, and it's just a, it's a brand new way of working. Some enjoyed it, some would rather it still be in person. But as long as it gets the job done, it gets the job done. Well, I had a team also spread around the world, although I was only, because of when, when I first went to New Zealand, we weren't allowed to bring it very many people in. I could bring one person with me from, from my team. And then the other, you know, then I brought one, then I was allowed my music editor, my senior uh, supervising sound editor, um, Dick Bernstein. And then we had one local assistant from New Zealand, uh, Robin Bryant, who was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but the rest of my team were dotted around the world. And I was able to use time zones to my advantage. Finish writing a cue, say at 10 p.m. in New Zealand, which would be 10 a.m. in London, then hand it over to, to one of my team, for instance, Simon Rhodes or Stephen Baker or Graham Foote, who were in London, and they could work through the day for them, working on stuff, or doing an orchestration or a mix or whatever. And then when I got back at 10 a.m. the next morning, I could then hand off from them. So we often got a 24-hour workflow going on certain pieces on certain times. Yeah, wow. That well, that that hard work it really paid off in the score. I tell you that. Oh, thank you. I, I, now um, let's go back a little bit and um, uh, where you first started originally. Uh, when you were growing up, did did you have many uh, musical influences that inspired you to go into music? Yeah, this is the only thing I could do. I know. I think I've said this many times before. <laughs> There's, uh, I wrote to the BBC when I was 13, and I said, "How do I become a record producer?" So I am basically unemployable to do anything else. I would be, um, I had one cool job. I was a sweeper. Uh, I used to sweep up um, uh, packets, uh, crisp packets and, uh, and candy wrappers uh, at London Zoo for one summer. But apart from that, I've only ever been a musician. Um, and uh, the influences, I, I came from a, a family for which classical music was a very important part of our lives. It was, it, I had a, um, there was a lot of classical music in my family. Um, and so that was what I thought I was being brought up with um, until The Damned played New Rose and I heard it on the radio. And that was punk and that changed my life. So I then suddenly discovered uh, punk rock and it became a uh, uh, that was my evolution and uh, it and so you know then I, th I have these um, I liked the age I liked you know there was all the things that rebellion everything we wanted from from uh, yeah from our music yeah that's what punk is man <laughs> I got yeah. into that in my early teens like 12 13 yeah. or like wow exactly. this is, I didn't know music could be this way <laughs> Yes, yes. Been a fan ever since. Um, yeah. you, you said you grew up in a household of classical music. Were your parents uh, musicians or? Both of them were good musicians. My, you know, my, both my dad and my mum. Uh, my mum still plays cello and piano. Um, uh, my dad played piano. He'd gone for classes held by Imogen Holst, uh, who was Gustav Holst. You know, he, he so. Yeah. 
uh, you know, but he was an amateur musician. He wasn't no, but, but my great uncle was a guy called Hans Keller. And Hans Keller okay. was um, a legendary musicologist. He was also one of the people who created the BBC Radio 3, the third program, which was the classical radio station in Britain. Um, and he was a close friend of major composers. And you know, he also taught at the Houdi Menuhin School. Um, so um, his, you know, I have a, uh, actually a painting just next over here in my studio, which is Stravinsky, that his wife, Milan Kosman, who was a paint, uh, painter, she did of uh, Stravinsky conducting, and I have it here. Um, so they, their music was important. My family, my mother's side of my family had come from Vienna, and there had been a idea that art and music was, uh, was important. And uh, and I think that's something that I was brought up with, that there, this wasn't something to be forgotten about. This was something that you needed to take seriously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, when uh, you said that you wrote in and said, hey, I want to be a music producer, you didn't have any formal training beforehand or was this like training on the job training? I'd or? gone in uh, my school. I'd, I'd gone from my junior school to my senior school and in my senior school, I walked in and there was the theater and I looked into the theater and it had a reel to reel tape machine and a mixing desk, a little six channel mixing desk. And I literally knew exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to explain, but there was like that moment. Um, and I started working in the studio, in the uh, theater there and I started mixing sounds and they then wrote back to me and said, well, you need a technical degree because they meant they thought I meant like a radio producer or something like that. And this is the BBC, right? This is where everything yeah. has to be perfect. So I sort of changed where the direction I was going on and I headed off to, instead of doing what I thought I was going to do, I ended up trying to go and get an electronics degree um, instead because that was what I thought I had to do. Um, but I started mixing, I think I got paid to mix uh, my first get my first check for, for actually doing sound was when I was 15. Um, I used to mix live gigs from about 15 onwards. And I was doing, you know, my own music and so on. But I, I knew I sort of knew where I wanted to go. Yeah, kind of instinctual just came naturally to you. Sounds yeah, like. and there was also, you know, there was the weirdest things though, that I, I went up to Manchester where was my degree was going to be at UMIST, which was like the sort of MIT type place in, in Britain. And um, and I hated it. I just hated every second of it. But what I discovered was that I had, a, uh, I had an aptitude for booking bands before they became big hits. I became the social mm. secretary, the guy that booked all the bands. Um, for my university and also Manchester at the time was an astonishing place for music. So yeah. I was member 346 or something like that, or 364. I can never quite remember why of the Hacienda club, the legendary Hacienda club. Yeah. Um, and I would see everybody on, you know, I go and see three gigs a night. Um, and again, I was still sort of doing my own thing on my own. Um, I had a Casio FX 502P calculator, mm -hmm. which had this thing that you could, it was one of these weird things that allowed you to have a tape backup. And the idea was that you could program it, you know, program algorithms into it and think, but there was a yeah. side thing, which it would make bleeps and you could tell it how long to make a bleep in a different tone. So you could sequence, I could make like, right, I want an A for three sixteenth notes, and now I want a C for one sixteenth note. And it was a very, very rudimentary sequencer. But I would start making sounds using that as well. Um, so, um, so I was up in Manchester, and then at some point I left and went, now I thought, oh, I'm going to be an artist. Um, which is probably, I think the world is safe that, that safer that I'd never made it. It was a good thing. Um, but I went into a tiny studio and recorded my demo of, you know, of my own stuff. And uh, somehow persuaded the studio manager, that he, the, the studio owner, that he needed a studio manager. Um, and he agreed as long as I took the, the great salary of 25 pounds a week. 
So uh, I got paid £25 a week to run this tiny studio in, in central London. Um, and at that time, it was an 8-track, then it became a 16-track. And then the owner, and I think this is sort of like a pivotal moment for me, he decided he had an interest in electronics in, in music, and he bought a thing called the PPG Wave and Wave Term, which is one of the mm -hmm. very first um, sampling. Sam it was one of the very first samplers. We could sample yeah, before, we could, yeah. So we could we could trigger a sound off or a delay or something like that. But this was the first time we'd ever been able to do this properly. There was that. There was the Fairlight. There was the Synclavia, and yeah. the PPG Wave had enormous memory. It could it could ha it had. Uh, I think initially we had 128 kilobytes. We may have upgraded to 256 kilobytes of RAM, <laughs> um, which meant that you could get either a one kick drum, a snare drum, and a hi-hat, or one bass note. And so you would synchronize it to the tape and you would play your kick, snare, and your hi-hat. Yeah. And then you would delete those sounds and then you put your bass note in and you put you play the bass note and, and so on. And that's how we used to work. And it also had this fabulous synth called the PBG Wave, which was has this incredible wave. Um, uh, it, it, this was a... Um, uh, the, the waves in the PPG wave, I was using the 2.2 and 2.3. They just sounded amazing. And you can hear that all over the records of that period. Um, and it had one other advantage for me, which turned out to be an advantage for me, which is that it broke down all the time, like all the time. Um, yeah. And... So it would crash regularly, but it would need to go back to the distributors at least every nine or 10 days for a complete mm. rebuild because it would break. So I would go up to the distributors who happened to be also the distributors for the Synclavia, which was, I was, if I was in the Ford Pinto of sampling at the time, should we say, this was the Bentley Mulsanne in comparison. Mm. And, um, and the guy who was the distributor for both saw me and thought I had a, some talent. And he phoned up a guy called Trevor Horn, who was a record producer. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, he and said one half of the Bugles, right? Or Buggles, right? Yeah. And he yeah, was yeah. a huge record producer at the time. Yeah. Um, and said, you should hire this guy. You should hire Simon to be program for you. Um, and so I would, that would never happen if the PPG hadn't broken down all the time. So I would, so, um, I, I, I can thank Wolfgang Palm for the fact that I have a career. <laughs> That's amazing. There are little, little, uh, little things that you just don't know where they lead to. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, uh, my brother and I, we, we started, uh, making our own films when we were about 12 or 13 and, uh, we would incorporate, you know, our own music using, the synthesizers at the time, which was like late eighties, early nineties. And yeah, yeah. the same always broke down only a few kilobytes. And I mean, it was horrible at the time. And you look back at, back at it now and you're like, those were really fun times. Those were like, you really got your, your taste of what it really is like to, to go into music and entertainment industry. And, um, Sometimes I, I miss it sometimes. And then other times I'm like, well, I'm glad we have the technology we do today. It's something that I still cherish. I think there's something in, I, in an, I have an old, in some ways, there's elements of what I do, although I think are very much the cutting edge. But there, yeah. there are parts of my process that are, I think, rooted in what I, what I learned then. One of them being make a, make a commitment so rather than leaving everything like, you know, oh, well, I, you know, I, I, I think it's almost, I, I often will commit, you know, something, say, right, this is it, and I'm fixing it, I'm locking it in place. And, you know, I can go back and undo if I want to, but it's that I think the idea that everything has to be available and, 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 and uh, to tweak sometimes actually leaves us uh, not actually refining is sometimes you get to the point where you spend so much time refining, you lose the um, clarity of thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, you know, and and you learn perfection in a way. Like working with eight millimeter film, 
you know, it only was like maybe 15, 20 minutes worth of film. So we had yeah. to learn how to make everything just right, just perfect because we couldn't redo it. And I'm sure you totally experienced agree. that too. And yeah, you know, that the, they were fun times and, um, it, you, I'm sure you learned a lot from uh, Trevor Horn, uh, about music oh, absolutely, producing. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, oh, without a doubt. And you know, that was, he was, you know, he, well, I learned a huge amount and then I made a decision to leave there, went off mm -hmm. freelance to do my own thing and also to start becoming a record producer on my own. And I was having some success, some success as a record producer in England when Synclavia phoned me up and said, and Synclavia had, had you know, they, they'd found a way for me to buy a Synclavia. I couldn't have afforded it, but they liked me having a Synclavia. It was this yeah, weirdest thing that they, the, where they thought I did good stuff with it. And so they found a shop soiled model or something like that, that I could buy. Um, they were, and, they were like the most expensive, uh, types that you could buy when they first came out. And um, yeah, yeah. So you were able it to was get a house. One. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. So they were, they were uh, able to get you one on the, on the cheap then, huh? Oh yeah, the cheap did still involve several years of <laughs> repayments and and some pain and agony. It's fair to say, um, mm -hmm. but at some point I was asked to as a favor to them, would I go and work, go back to my day job as a program as a synth player, to work with an American engineer who who worked with Michael Jackson, and um, this was a guy called Humberto Gatica, who was okay, um, yeah. who is still one of the world's great engineers. One of the things yeah. throughout my career is I've been very lucky that I get uh, almost throughout, I've always been able to have the greatest engineers on the planet at one, uh, avail, you know, for that I can feed off. And it was an astonishing engineer and he looked at me programming. We were working on a record in a residential studio in England. And so I spent mm -hmm. several weeks working with him and he said, nobody programs like you. I've never seen anybody program like you. You should come to Los Angeles. And I was looking at the music scene in England at the time, which was the sort of Stock Aiken and Waterman type material, which was not particularly where I wanted to be. Um, and I, I thought, oh, well, you know, one of the things, you know, you, do you take a risk? Yeah. So I got on a plane. I took the Synclavier and I went to LA um, and land in LA and said to Humberto, I'm here. And he said, get here now. Literally, um, I did two sessions on the first day. I couldn't believe it. Um, wow. I then didn't work for six months, but it was, uh, but then it, 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 I, I sort of came out the other side. Um, I would commute back and forth between England and LA. So I was still doing work in England <laughs> and that would pay for me to stay in Los Angeles a bit longer. Um, and at some point, you know, Humberto worked with a guy called David Foster, who was a record producer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. David and I st met and we started doing records together and we just hit it off almost immediately. We had, we provided a very good, I think I provided a balance for David, which is that m he is the most ridiculously talented keyboard oh, player, yeah. musician, arranger. Yeah. And he provided a beautiful, this, this, these exquisite things. And then I, I, my thing was groove and, and stuff like that, but also I gave him a little edge, I think in some ways. Um, and so we started doing records together and that went rather well. Um, and there's a period in the nineties where I'm doing like, I don't know, I just, it seems like I'm doing number one after number one after number one after number one it just constantly yeah, look looking at the people you worked with uh record producer engineer like you mentioned you mentioned michael jackson madonna uh celine dion uh people bryson uh pink floyd you did a 3d immersive yeah. installation which i would, would like to talk about later with that yeah uh, i mean you, you worked with the biggest names the biggest talent and what was that like? It must have been mind blowing. You're actually here with these people, with the talent, with the uh, these wonderful producers and and music makers. What was going through your mind then? Well, I think I, I'll give an example. I mean, one of the records I'd made was Quincy with Quincy. I did Q's Juke mm -hmm. Joint with Quincy, 
uh, and some other things. But Quincy, there is a famous phrase from We Are The World that was stuck on the door, which was check your ego at the door, right? And, and yeah. we're all musicians. We're all sitting there trying to make whatever we're working on better. And almost invariable, variably, what I found is that the ones, the people for whom the music is the most important thing are the ones who are the most successful. The people for whom their ego is the most successful thing tend to do less well over the longer term. And mm -hmm. as somebody for whom, uh, the, you know, as, 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 as somebody who, who prides himself on the quality of what he does, I, I take pride in my work. Um, and love the experimentation of what we can do as collaborators with other musicians. Um, that I think is something that I've never had a problem with working with anybody because we're just ultimately two musicians working or three or 10 musicians working in the same room. It's like me conducting an orchestra. Now I am not the best conductor in the, in the world. Um, but I was talking to the, the you know, members of the orchestra who said, they like it when I conduct because there's an energy and there's a clarity of idea that I give because I can sort of like hone in on the things that um, they want. And I think that, you know, I give them feedback that they like. And since it's my music, they, uh, you know, they, I, I clarify what I need. And I think when I'm working yeah. with David or, you know, or Celine or, or Quincy or Michael or whoever, part of that was that everybody was just trying to do the best they could and the same goes with film music you know in terms of the work I did with you know I started on with John Barry that was my first film composer proper film composer I met and started working with as an Englishman that is a you know he's like <laughs> one of our heroes because everybody oh, yeah. wants to be double seven um but then that evolved to Alan Silvestri and then mm -hmm. from Alan Silvestri I started working with Howard Shaw and then I started working with James Horner on Titanic. And all of these people have a similar, they have completely different approaches, but they have a similar thing, which is that there is a good enough isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. You have to make it so that it absolutely is great. Um, you have to have a love for the music. You know, you're, you can tell a difference between someone who's just doing it for the money and someone who's doing it for the art. Uh, someone who's doing it for the art cares about it, spends time on it, massages it, makes it as good as it can be. And those who are just in it for the money just really, they have some talent, but they really, that enthusiasm just isn't with them. And, um, and I'm sure the, the orchestra that you conduct, they can feel your energy, they can feel your passion uh, while you're up there conducting, and uh, which inspires them to do the best job they can do. I think that's fair. I think it's also the uh, I remember when I was working with, with uh, John Barry, you know, he always tells a story of that he was, his dad owned a cinema in uh, Leeds. And he used to, when he was three years old, he'd look up and see this enormous image on the screen. And that was a thing that, uh, you know, that you fall in love. And I think the same thing applies now today with me, with Jim, is I go and I'm just sitting there going, oh, I love this <laughs> picture and then you start trying to all I'm trying to do is reflect the film you know I have to you know the, and I think all good film composers um, are there to try and reflect the film the film tells them what to write and then the director should give them the critique to get the, to get them to where he wants or she wants them to be um, the problem we have in, in a lot of films is that then there will be 10 other producers who will believe that their input is as important as the director's. Um, Everyone has their with, own ideas. With Jim, there's, you don't have to worry about that. There is only Jim's idea. Now, that obviously means that um, I'm under no misconception of whose score this is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the process because it, it, Jim actually makes my music better. Often I would write a cue and it would be, I think this is great. I love this. And then what actually happens is I hand Jim the cue 
and then he takes it into his avid. And it may stay, it may stick, but quite often what actually starts happening is he goes, oh, you know what, I want, what happens if I move that bit here? And he'd often say to me, hey, I moved it a second ahead and it's got better because this thing. Now that may be an easy thing, but often actually he goes, well, actually I like this bit here and I want to put it over here and I want this bit here. And now he shows me having had a piece of music that I thought flowed like this. Now I have a piece of music that flows like this and I have yeah. to try and rebuild it. But I think without exception, Jim's revisions of my cue, however hideous then, uh, you know, they were in terms of the reworking I had to do to get his, get the idea, but his clarity of line and his, there's a vision there. And once you, mm -hmm. once, you know, it was my job to like hone in on getting that, my, making his vision into a piece of music. He can't write music. He would say that his, his ear for music is not great. I would disagree. I think he's got a great ear for music, but it's not a purist musician's ear. It's, sure. uh, it's got, he's, he's got a, he's got a listener dash critics ear. Yeah. And he's also got a, but he has a phenomenal sense of how music should play in a Jim Cameron film. He has the best sense of how music should play in a Jim Cameron film. And for me, that makes my life really easy because at the point that Jim is happy, I think that I can then, you know, that that's, he'll take ownership of the music. Um, like he takes ownership of everything else in the film. Um, and my job was to make is to serve the picture. And that's my first, my first role is, is that conversation you have with the picture, which is that mm -hmm. one that creates those notes in your fingers and so on, is that the picture tells you what to write and you sit down and you write it. And eventually I will sit there and then have that argument with myself about whether it's any good. And there yeah, is it, the... Uh, ref just a quick question. Uh, a lot of composers like uh, John Williams, they'll watch the film without any sound uh, and then there's other ones that will watch it with the, either a tip score or, or just the, uh, the sound itself, along with the picture. What, what, what's your preference? Um, in a perfect world, I always have no temp. Sometimes on some projects, I'll have no temp. But in this case, Jim gave me a temp. And sometimes we varied from it. Sometimes we didn't, you know, depending on what was going on. And also, he would also take music that I'd written and start taking bits from one place and putting them elsewhere. And I would be doing rewrites because he'd heard something in a queue I'd written here that he liked and thought that they would work better over here. Um, and by the way, that's a process that he did to James Horner on Titanic and Avatar. Um, the, the idea that the music was just a one way flow from the composer to Jim um, is wrong. What happens is that, is that there is a conversation that happens between Jim and a composer that, and Jim looks at the music as being part of that. You know, the opening cue in Titanic, we had got mm. to put a, to get a cue together that had was a very a single particular idea. I remember very clearly because I, I my job on Titanic was to sort of be the sort of fake orchestra because we had no money, and um, we'd made we there was this cue as you go down you dive into the wreck, mm -hmm. and that was great. Listen to it, Jim. Listened to it, came in and went, yeah, this is great. And then later on in the process, much later in the process, he actually took five different sections of different cues and just put them on top of each other as you go in. And it's incredibly effective, but it was nothing like the cue that was actually written. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, you see the, the best filmmakers, the best directors really work very closely with the, uh, with the composer. Um, you know, the, the best movies that I have seen pers personally, you can tell when the director works closely with the, with the composer. You can tell that, it, that the music really means something and adds something to the movie instead of just sound, instead of just ambient noise. Um, I, I wanted to, you worked, uh, you said you worked with John Barry uh, and Howard Shore. With Howard Shore, you worked on Seven, is that right? Yes, I did, yeah, and a few <laughs> other films as well, yeah. Okay, with, with seven, what what were you a part of? How how did you help that score to grow? Well, for all of it's... the Celine's and Whitney's, I used to do for pop. I used to do the sort of smooth, 
big epic pop songs with with howard I, I he asked me to do the sort of grunge and so in this case uh he wanted me to give this dystopian edge to the entire score um and so i did things like i sampled brake squeals the squealing brakes and i made them into a patch in the synclavia and i played the violin parts with uh -huh. the brake squeals so where you hear the violins often there is a layer of brake squealing yeah. that goes underneath the violin line to give you this edge and it just you, gives it or yeah. something like that in these screeching um, brakes or i did things i put the entire orchestra through a fuzz box now now today it mm. sounds boring we do it all the time but then it was something that was sort of quite cool and yeah. howard was very much an experimenter and was very happy for me to do those things and this is obviously pre lord of the rings so this is when he we're in the the sort of more edgy side of his phase after after um silence of the lambs and so on yeah yeah I mean, the score to seven it's just phenomenal i just love how you all incorporated just the darkness it just added more intense and darkness to the but an already dark and intense movie and it, it just yeah, helped it, it was just put it was on very much level. a thing yes and, and i think that was there was an, a conscious decision by by Howard to ask me to give him this layer of of just of almost like your fingers on your blackboard on the blackboard. Let's we say there had to be this tension element that the orchestra itself provided some of, but we needed to. I just needed to give him that electronically with synths and with samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always bugged me for years. I could never find the score score to buy i always love the score and then i think in 2012 2013 or 14 howard shore on his uh, uh release company production company released the soundtrack to the public oh and right I, I i got two two copies of that score <laughs> and i just i listened to it all the time uh, <clears throat> and of course you know james horner wh wh how did you get involved with james horner so as a so with titanic I was working with Alan Silvestri. I think we were doing a film called Contact, and okay, yeah. um, and his agent was the same agent was James Horner's agent, and phoned me up and said, "Look, would you go and see James?" And the first thing I went, met them was that, that there was this problem. There was this problem film that everybody knew about in Hollywood, which was the <laughs> film that Cameron's Folly that was going to bring down Fox Pictures and Twenty yeah. and Paramount studios both of them were going to go, come go crashing down because of the fact that it was so massively over budget and the f music budget was microscopic absolutely microscopic really and there wasn't money for orchestra hmm. so i was the guy who could use computers to make you know like orchestral sounds with the synclavia and make okay. some interesting textures with synths and yeah. so I went to talk to James and he said, well, let's do a test. They found some money for a demo for me to do. And I, the first thing I got was the, a VHS cassette of the sinking. Mm -hmm. And you look at this and you think, this is pretty incredible. Um, mm -hmm. and so I worked on this on a cue that he had, it was all fully orchestrated by, by James and Don Davis, I think it was. So there was a fully orchestrated cue and they wanted me to do the, like the, the, orchestral elements and then also add a little extra something in there um and i played it back to him and they said yeah well, this is great because it was all, as much as anything also to give jim cameron an idea of what was uh, what the, the score was going to be like but that rapidly evolved into us decamping to a studio in calabasas in california called castle oaks and there was a small room smaller than the room I'm in now, um, where I would sit on one side with my two tons of synths, and then there would be a tiny gap with a little chair where Jim Cameron would sit, then in the middle there would be a keyboard for James Horner to play, and then on the left-hand side was Ian Underwood. Um, and the three of us made this score. Um, the problem was we had so little money, uh, we had to, I had to, uh, call up manufacturers to borrow loudspeakers and a mixing desk and things because I had to engineer the synths because mm -hmm. there was no money to hire Sean Murphy until later in the process. 
James then had a found a way to get some money for some orchestra. Um, but there's a reason, for instance, that take it to see Mr. Murdoch is four and a bit minutes and and a few years ago when we did the Titanic live show at, at the Albert mm -hmm. Hall, we had to revisit that. And I always presumed, oh, it must be hugely orchestral. And I looked back and discovered that three quarters of it is just synth and it's only at the key change at the end that it becomes orchestral. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, those are the things, the compromises we were making them, the bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, ba, dum, yeah. bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum was made up of about six or seven synths between me and Ian Underwood. The idea was it was going to be replaced by the Harlem Boys Choir, who he Horner had worked with on things like Glory. And, but we had no money, so the synth stuck. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the sort of thing, you know, and obviously in the middle of that, he gives me a piano sketch on paper of this song. Um, and... I and said, well, you've worked with Celine before. And I said, could you make it sound l like a track for Celine? So I then programmed up what became fundamentally the, the version of, of My Heart Will Go On that you hear. Mm -hmm. um, though they did allow me to put some orchestra on the end of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this before. It's a ter tremendous, wonderful score, triumph score. My, uh, my mom never was a, a big score fan. She loved movies, but was never a big orchestra score fan. She gravitated more towards like the music inspired rock music. And I was, uh, I remember I was like, mom, you got to hear this. And I put in this, the CD and I played it and she's like, wow, this is amazing. This is really good. And uh, I said, see how awesome film score is just on yeah. its own. I mean, just listen to it. Listen to the orchestra, listen to the different pieces, the sounds, the synthesizer, uh, people work tirelessly to make these happen. And, you know, like you said, Fox and everybody thought this was going to be a tremendous folly. But I always said, even back then, I was, I was telling my friends, never bet against James Horner. I mean, James Horner and Jim Cameron, you're going to get something that's truly mind blowing and truly amazing. And Titanic, Avatar, Way of Water, you know, he just continues to push the envelope on his film. Yeah, every, I have to say that going into work every day on this one was just, you know, you just sit there and bask in these new images. Every so every day we get a new, often get a new section that had been rendered a little bit better. And so what went from what we call template to the final render, you know, as you saw stuff come and you just sit there, oh, it's so beautiful. And, and yeah. or, it's, or it's so emotional. You know, I think that people forget how, you know, way, the way of water, I think, is a, for all of the visual spectacle, I think as a pure emotional film of a story of, of a, a mother and a father trying to save their family, I mm -hmm. think works on a complete, it's a, st a stupendous piece of filmmaking by Jim. Yeah. And there is only, as far as I can tell, you know, in my opinion for what it's worth, is the two great directors of action music, or three of action, would be um, would be Jim, mm -hmm. you know, McTiernan, and probably Frankenheimer for for some of the stuff. But the, you take the you look at Jim's pacing on action is is second to none, and you look at yeah. some of those big action sequences later on in the film. And every time you're, it's the way that he keeps that journey going and keeps your interest. And the, nothing is, nothing is, I mean, you know, it sounds stupid because we've got the title of the song and nothing is wasted, but nothing is wasted in a Jim film. He, mm. he's so efficient in the way that he actually moves you through a scene. And I think that he doesn't allow us to linger, even on that Payakan score, the cue that we were talking about, where, Mm -hmm. There's that point when Loak and Pycan are there and there's that beautiful shot with the sunlight dappling through to, to Pycan. Yeah. And you go, this is the most beautiful thing. I need another 30 seconds because I could write so much. And you go, no, 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 we're done. We're on to the next thing. <laughs> and, and that is many other directors would wallow in a scene like that and make it twice as long. But Jim, 
is rigorous about getting on to the next bit. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a three hours and 12 minute movie. And I think going, going further, you know, that's, that's like a wary to a lot of, a lot of companies because they want oh, yeah. to get people out and have the next audience in. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, I can tell uh, you also, the, yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that I, the stuff on the cutting room floor is mm -hmm. just, there is some incredible scenes that will, that, never made it through he's rigorously he he's pretty uh, ruthless with himself yeah yeah um now i i did have a question yeah. working with cameron did he approach you after horner's sad sad passing did he approach you initially to go ahead and score avatar 2 or did he do you know if he looked for like alan Silvestri who scored the abyss or or someone else or did he or did you know that this was going to be your your film he asked me initially at because uh, they asked me Jim and John asked me to take over the music for the park at the time that James had died he'd written some a theme for one of the park rides but I was going to oversee all of the park stuff the Pandora world of Avatar thing which yeah. is a was a huge undertaking um, this sort of like a billion dollar bet for you know for making this park in Florida. And there was five hours of music to, to write and deliver for the park. And we were at the sort of like commencement of that when James died. And mm -hmm. they and Jim and John and Disney Imagineering asked me to then take over that. And that okay. took me another two years of work on and off. I was doing other things like Mag Magnificent Seven and some other things. Yeah. But, I, but a lot of my time was taken dealing with the park. Um, and that finished in the summer of 2017. And in December 2017, Jim phoned me up and said, I need you to read the scripts. And he wanted me to read all of them. He wanted me to read two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. And part of that was that there needed to be stuff for the on-screen music, the thing we talked about the, in terms of that point where we have the... Um, you know, there were things written into the script that were there and he needed me to write those immediately because they need to be shot by Zoe Saldana singing the, the, the song chord mm -hmm. in March of 2018. So there had to be a song chord. Um, there were all these things that needed. There were other elements that actually ended up being cut out as well. But there's a lot of material that, that he asked me to write. And he wasn't interested in talking about the score at that point. Yeah. But he did ask me sometimes, say, well, what would happen if you if you scored this? You know, and there are actually snippets of early things where I he said, I said, well, I have oh, this isn't scored, but I've just added a little extra here. And there are some bits of that that are in the final score, things that were part of demos that we were using for other elements um, in uh, in the film. Um, and as we we just continue talking and then. Uh, he said, well, why don't you go and write me some themes? Hmm. And so I wrote off the script, I wrote the song chord theme based on the Zoe song, but I expanded into a big orchestral theme, the thing called Home Tree, Home Tree yeah. on the album. Yeah. Um, and then I wrote the skimming, uh, the Return of the Tulkoon theme, mm -hmm. which at that point I'd called Skimming the Waves, which was, again, written straight off the script. And... Wow. Um, and that, and then I started, and I did some other stuff. There's a, even a piece when Jake is going out to. Um, there's a point when he is he's heading out across the ocean to meet up to 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 face Corage. And there's a piece from those original original attempts where I wrote a piece called Preparation for War mm -hmm. that has ended up in the film. Again, that was written off. Wow. Um, then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And they they had to work out how they were going to finish the film. So that a, a whole crew of them went down to New Zealand. They were in New Zealand. I was uh, in England, I think, at that time. And um, I said, no, no, this is I know. Then he asked me to go down to New Zealand. This is December 2019. So I went down to New Zealand. I met up with him and we talked a little further about this. And he said, well, I'd like you to think about maybe whether you'd like to do some test scoring because he wanted to try some ideas out and also see what my style was like. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you know he was you know i'm sure they were probably talking to it uncle tom cobbley and all wouldn't you yeah. if you're doing the biggest movie in time in, <laughs> in the world you know sure. um and uh so he asked me to do some test cues um that got held up obviously with covid but eventually i was able to do those, do those test cues in 2021 mm -hmm. and much of those test cues are in the finished film so parents from hell bad parents is from my test cues the knife fight is from my test cues the final version of home tree is from uh, uh, no sorry no the um um family is our fortress was one of the test yeah. cues um and with the torture machine and so on so there were things like that there was a load of different material that is in the final article though you know where the scenes hadn't actually changed that much um so a lot of that test material made it through um there was a version of some of the elements for um the into the water but a, it was a variation of that i had some ideas mm -hmm. but it never and they it was a different sort of cue um so then we'd done the test and then he said he said well i'm not ready yet to commit i'm not ready to commit and then eventually mm. uh as we're doing this I, we're talking more and and so on and he said it's not because it's just i need to focus on the images and then he said yeah, yeah okay you know you know your kid you're in the movie and um and then we had to prepare for how we were going to do that and that was when i had was going to had to build these studios in New Zealand next to him so that mm. we could work together. Yeah. Uh, did uh, did Horner write any cues for for Way of Water previously that you used, or was that no, not used? at all? No, it didn't even okay. exist. It was oh, okay. Horner was uh, you know Horner had died in 2015. Mm -hmm. The film scripts probably weren't even you know James had agreed to do all of the sequels at that point, but no, there were no cues written for Avatar okay. for, for Avatar two, three, four, and five. From James, mm -hmm. um, how challenging? Oh, how challenging did you find it to work to score just from script instead of besides seeing the vi instead of seeing the visuals? Did you find that more challenging, well, or was it more freeing? Well, in this show, that was just concept, so that's easy. No, that's fine. And okay. also, a Jim Cameron script is really detailed, so that you can absolutely see, you know, you can see what's happening, and I think that's it does make it easier when you read a script that tells you exactly what you're going to see and it just appears and then oh, yeah. the notes just appear and then you just do it. Um, just, and then he started giving me picture. Yes, it was, it would have been late 20, early 21. I started getting just chunks of picture to work mm -hmm. from. Um, and that was really just for us also to continue that conversation. Now, it, you know, since he was already cutting stuff that I had written into the film, you know, so I would see that there would be temp cues from, you know, like the home tree cue would appear in the film and so on. So there were things yeah. he, he was he was liking about what I was doing. Um, and we had a good working relationship. I think we do have a good working relationship. You know, I've done all his films for the last 25 years. Mm hmm. You know, if you take it this way, that there, if there have been three films in the last 25 years, I've done all of them. I've been part of that. And that yeah. he is, a lot of his crew, that's true of. Um, because, you know, Jim works in a particular way. And mm -hmm. that there's a challenge to that because you, um, you want, um, uh, because Jim has, you know, he has a real focus on what he wants to focus on. Um, sure. But there's also a clarity to that. And I think that, that for, you know, it, it, I enjoy it. I find it fabulous and I love the challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's true of all the people who work on, on a Jim Cameron film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to go back to uh, uh, the Pink Floyd 3D yeah. uh, installation that you did. I was... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me when i was i was talking to my younger brother about that and he's like 3d isn't music already kind of 3d <laughs> and <clears throat> i was like well i guess in a way but this is different would you go ahead and explain what that 3d installation immersive sound installation that you did uh yes. is really about for those who don't know so 
I have a Shreya's, my other specialist nerd subject is immersive audio in all its forms, especially in large scale install installations. What happens mm -hmm. when you make a big room, like a big room into something that you can place things. And I've got a, I've got an installation that runs, for instance, at the top of the Shanghai Tower with 240 loudspeakers, where I have the music of four interlocking orchestras in 3D. So you can walk inside the music. Um, and you can place sounds very, very detailed uh, throughout that 3D space. And because I'm known for some of the things I've done in immersive audio, um, some friends, you know, the, the basically Pink Floyd came and asked me if I would produce mixes for them. Uh, I worked mm -hmm. with my engineer, Simon Rose. We, we created an immersive space. The idea was that they were doing this exhibition called their mortal remains, which was going yeah. to be initially at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, then tour around the world. Mm -hmm. And in this space, they had a, a, quite a big area. It turned out to be almost the same size as Abbey Road Studio 2, the Beatles studio, yeah. which is where we actually then did these remixes. Um, and they gave us the multitracks. They gave us literally the those master tapes of those tracks and say, mm -hmm. go ahead and now make you, everybody knows how they should sound. There's no yeah. way that you're going to, and, and we worked with uh, uh, um, Andy Jackson engineer as well, um, because Andy was they sit there and go, yeah, no, maybe that's, you know, maybe we've gone too far or got, not gone far enough and so on. But the idea was that I was allowed freedom to make a mix and it's something special because we had these huge, um, actually, you can, uh, these big Neumann loudspeakers. In fact, you can see like that rack, the, the thing over there. That is a Neumann studio reference loudspeaker uh, stack. And it's incredibly detailed. And the bass is incredible. Uh, and it's my reference leader. But we had 25 of those arrayed in this space in three dimensions. So that we had the equivalent of like, imagine the world's, finest PA system, incredibly loud if we want to do, but just the most detail you've ever heard. And we could place sound in there. And they gave me things like comfortably numb. And I was able to go, hello, 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 <laughs> with Roger Waters above like six yards, six meters over our head. So you put him up there. And then what we've discovered was a way of anchoring the music we placed um, Nick Mason in the middle of the room, because what was interesting was when you try and make it like a standard 3D mix, then everybody just looks over there. I didn't want yeah. that. I wanted people to be able to walk around inside the music. And so what I did was put Nick Mason in the middle of the room. And once we did that, that sort of gave us an anchor, an anchor. And then we started putting the band in slightly onto the different walls and spaces so that you could put Roger over here. And what that meant was the, the mix was always coherent. You could always hear the mix of the song, but if you walked towards Roger and there was four, there was 3D projection as well. So you were seeing images from all the band members and we placed them to go with the sound. So you could walk towards Roger and you would hear the bass more clearly, but the mix would never collapse, which was really important. You could still always hear the mix, but you could say go and focus in on roger's part or you could walk over to um to david's guitar work over here or you could walk over to uh rick's keyboard playing here or to mm -hmm. the backing vocals or and so on and we did some spinning around stuff i remember you know we did a thing with arnold lane where we started it absolutely mono and right so there's there it's bashed down the middle and then, ba -da -da, da -da -da, ba -da. and then, and then I went, ba -da. and so the, the whole room suddenly explodes. So they think they're listening to it just like this. And then we just made it massively surround. And there were things like that, that we were able to do. Um, and it was a huge success. It, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people went and listened to this. It was sold out yeah. for months on end. Um, yeah, and I'm very, very proud to see it. Yes. Yeah, I desperately wanted to see it myself, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to. My dad got sick at the time, so I had oh, to stay I'm so home sorry. and 
Yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, yeah. Do you have any plans for doing that for other bands or has anybody else come to you? We did talk to some other bands. I mean, there is some things I would love to do. I to do more of this because when you hear, you know, we all do our Dolby Atmos mixes and, and we've done a Dolby Atmos mix for this film, you know, for the film score. Mm -hmm. What you can, you obviously you can sit down and you can, the great thing about the way that now with spatial audio on, on streaming is that we've gone from some of the crappiest audio we've ever had in our lives to some of the best almost overnight. Mm -hmm. But when Apple announced spatial audio, we went from everybody thinking the audio was an MP3 to it now being a 2496 Atmos master, which uh, or 2448 master. And, and that is, you know, for us, you know, for, for somebody like me, for who, for whom sound is important, that's just great. But we have done Atmos mixes and what you hear, in those Atmos mixes is what we put into the film. Now, wow. all the balance of things. Now, the, the actual mm -hmm. mixes are my mixes for the soundtrack album. So they're not, the mix you may see here in the film is Jim's variation of that. There's, because, you know, you pull things down to stay out the way of a dialogue. You do this to, because you want to try to hit a sound effect or you're trying to move the, something out the way. So the film, you know, music in a film is always a compromise. But the album hopefully is my, is where I get to actually tell you, this is how I hoped it would sound. Um, mm -hmm. And there are compromises sometimes, like I remember on the Cove of the Ancestors queue, where I initially went really big when we see this. And then the problem was that there was a dialogue line and I was stomping all over the dialogue line. So I had to pull it back a bit. Um, and there are times like that, that you do this, but in terms of what you're talking about with immersive audio and other yeah. bands, I love doing those things. Um, because you get, I've done some test things with old recording, you know, I've done like, I'm, I, in this room here, we mix, remix some stuff like, uh, the Staples singers, you know, and you hear them. And when you hear the whole band and because now instead of it all just being over there, you've now got all of these walls where you can put people, you know, express yeah. yourself in proper surround is a pretty ridiculously great thing to do to hear. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, something, or, yeah. something audiophiles have been desperately wanting for years. And now we finally have it. It's it's truly amazing. It really is. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, about the end of this, um, first, I uh, got some, a couple of viewer questions. I'd yes, like of course. Go ahead. Mine. Hey, we got one from uh, Michael H. He asks, when composing a score, how much does the director control the score? Or do directors leave you alone and you just do what you do? It depends on the director. With Jim, Jim has a very, very firm idea about what he wants in the music, but he also allows me the room to 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 him to um, to uh, experiment. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've always said to anybody is, you've got to give me the I, I've reserved the right to be wrong, and because that is the process, is finding right often allows means you have to go through down a few uh, wrong alleys until you get to the right uh, right road, and um, no, but Jim has. Jim is also responding. Often there'll be things where I will take a, I will write a cue and he loves it. And then as he evolves his opinion, he thinks about it, he sits with it, and then he starts doing his snip and making it and saying, no, come back. Well, let me just, what happens if I move this here and everything else? And suddenly he gives me back a piece of music that is different, but is now Jim Cameron, which is very important. Now he's somebody for whom he wants to have a tactile interaction with the school. With someone like, um, I mean, I just did it at the beginning of this year, just I finished a score with a guy called Jean-Jacques Arnaud, who is a mm -hmm. phenomenal French director, you know, a name mm -hmm. of the rose uh, and so yeah. on. And, um, and Jean-Jacques, uh, when I start uh, looking at this, uh, the, the film, which is, is an amazing film about the saving of Notre Dame, yeah, I said, there's no temp score. He said, well, I don't want a temp score. You just go and write what you think. And that mm. is great. Now we had a relatively limited budget, but what we did do is he and I spent time on themes so that he would, he and I would get to a point where we would find themes and textures that he liked. And then the next thing he wanted is he just, he had, I would send him cues as I was doing them. And 
he just allowed them to be there. There was probably one or two cues where he asked me to make some changes based on something mm -hmm. that I wasn't quite thematically hitting. But his opinion is that he hires a composer to go and write music. So let them do that because he thinks that it gives a flow to the score, that the score now has its own, it, it has to have a character. And he thinks that it, the more people that get involved in that character, the less the score retains that thing. So um, he's an example of somebody for whom it's exact opposite to many people. You know, there are lots mm -hmm. of people you work with where it's literally they want you to do exactly that. And I have been involved on films where the temp, where I have been told, no, no, you mean, no, no, not like that, that. <laughs> and that's the most depressing thing that happens. Oh, sure. It's like, well, why don't you just use the existing music? Why do I have to recreate it for you? <laughs> Let me exactly. Do my job. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But we're, we're guns for hire. I mean, we write music by the yard. When I write pure classical music that is going to be played in a concert hall, then that's my, I can do anything I want. And I can just write it and I can go sit there. And the only person whose opinion I care about is my own. But when we're writing film music, the film is telling us what to write. But also we have to get that sense where the director feels that we have cor cor correctly reflected the emotional flow that he, he or she wants in the film, because that's what our job is. We're there to give that sense of emotion, give that sense of connection in a way that almost anything else can't do. A sound effect can't give you that sense of connection with the characters. Um, and especially in a film like Avatar, where there's so, uh, Way of Water, where so much is underwater, where there is only the music to act as the narrator for what we're seeing. That's a really important connection. That was something that Jim and I worked on at in depth, trying to make sure that we had um, that connection so that it, the narration that happens from the score is right. And that's really important. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, another question we have from uh, Kitty. She asks, uh, working, did you work with Magnificent Seven, did you work with Anton Fuqua closely finishing that score or were you left to your own devices? No, no, Antoine's great. I, I, I have the, I, I did several things with Antoine and, and no. So I had taken him a suite of themes and then he and I, uh, I went down to see him in Louisiana where they were shooting the film and then we talked and then I started working and um, he would come over to my studio, come over to here on a regular basis to hear things and then he would have opinions and there were several cues that got completely rebuilt because he loved something and then he thought well maybe it's too much there was a cue called um, several An seven angels of vengeance where i wrote it in one way then he said yeah it's too it doesn't have quite enough uh like cowboy joy should we say and so mm -hmm. we stopped it we dumped it we, I wrote another one, which was more perky and more up. And then he listened to it and guys, no, no, you were, we were right the first time. And that's okay. There are lots of times when you write music and, and you know, and, and directors have to, they have to come into the score. They, you, because, you know, they may have lived with a temp for a while and therefore they have temp. And this is Antoine is very good about not having that. But is there anything where you, anything new, it's a new color that comes into your film and that you sort of suddenly go I'm, oh wait a second there's a pink throw on that sofa do i like that pink yeah. throw on that sofa metaphorically and it eventually you've got to work out whether you like it pink or whether you want it blue and um uh and that's part of that growth that the director goes through with your music because for me I've had that thing going around for however long, and then sure. I spent time refining it. I spent time demoing it up, and then I hand it to the director. And I, for me, it's now finished, and I've, I'm on to something else in my head. But to them, suddenly they're presented with this, this pink throw in their black and white film. And they have got to work out how they then get to a point where they love it. Now, sometimes, if you're lucky, they can just go, bang, I love this. Mm -hmm. On Magnificent Seven, I made a sound up out of a banjo and I took a banjo and I plucked it. Um, actually, I got a guy called Ian Stevenson, who was a folk musician. We detuned the banjo 
and I got it, him to play it right up by the bridge. So you got this really scratchy, horrible texture. And I made this texture and then I started manipulating the samples. So they were going in and out of tune and they're feeling wrong. And I had some reverse banjo echoes happening. And this became the sound um, as our baddie walks down through the church and walks up to the front. And I use it at the end again when, uh, when Denzel comes through the church again. And this texture, it had to be, it, it was a sort of minimal, minimalist thing. And I sort of was there. That was something Antoine immediately went, yeah, this is amazing. I love this. And I put a string line against it. And my inspiration from that was actually one of my favorite scores, which is all, all mm. one of my uh, favorite ideas of a score, you know, which is uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, yeah. where you, yeah. there's this scene I always remember where you hear the creaking floorboards outside and mm -hmm. so on. And I, I decided that I was effectively what, there needed to be only two things. There were the sound of, of uh, Skarsgård's feet and then there was the sound of this banjo, and then I gradually fed a high string line in. But I wanted to have that that Leone dash Morricone starkness about it, and that was an active choice. And Antoine was very like immediately got it and immediately went, "Yeah, this is great." Uh, anyway, he loved it as a texture because it worked for this thing. And I do like having space for all of the things that, which is you know, and obviously in. Avatar, in Way of Water, I've I've got five minutes of space, which is good in a three-hour, twelve-minute film. But the, uh, the it, there's not much space there. But the in in that queue, I liked the fact that there was air in there. Sure, yeah. And one of my favorite scores is that uh, what I really liked about it is that typically when someone does a remake, they'll remake the original score. But this was more of an original score for that film. And I really loved it. Uh, once it was out, I, I bought it and I just listened to it hours on end, just loving it. Oh, good. Okay. I'm very uh, pleased. Shannon asks, uh, film scores have been a passion of mine. What would you consider to be your go-to film score you would recommend to someone who isn't much familiar with film scores? Okay. So if you, if, if you're going to say, so that this is like the what is a film score in an out in a single album? Mm -hmm. You couldn't go and you could say that what is a film score? You could say let's start with the obvious ones that we might go with. We might go T as being a what is a film score? There is that emotional pull, but there's action and there's everything else. There's obviously Star Wars is a film score. There, there. If you were going to say here is a film that where the film is made infinitely better by the music. And I think that would be the definition of a great album for a film score. But, and I could also take Williams, you know, like Catch Me If You Can. You could imagine mm -hmm. how that film would have been without that score. But for me, I could also go off to a Touch of Evil um, with uh, Henry Mancini's first jazz score. That, uh, that point, that single shot, when you start and you've got uh, Charlton Henson, Hens Heston walking and the long, the long crane shot and everything else. And you hear the congas going and everything else. And then the piano, which played by one Johnny Williams. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it's great. You know, so I, I would say if you're going to take a great film and obviously take Titanic, cause it is a great score. Yeah, definitely. Did, uh, let's see, we got one last question from a viewer, Dave. Says, how much time are you generally given to score a film from start to finish, or does it depend on the movie itself? It also depends on where they are in the process. There are times when you get given two weeks to write eighty minutes of music because of something that may have happened in the process, or in this case, I've had the whole year to write more than three hours of music uh, to get to that point. So it can vary. It depends. Budget. Budget is a big part is do they have the budget to allow you the time to experiment? And then do they have the schedule to allow you? Because for some reason, they may not get you a finished a print that's ready for you to actually write music to, to until very late. So it's a, it is how long is a piece of string? Normally, I'd say you're talking about between eight and 10 weeks.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, we're done with those, and we got two more questions to ask that we ask everybody at the end of the interview. Do you have any suggestions on how someone who's interested in getting your line of work can get their foot in the door? Well, I would say the first thing is to stay unfired in everything else. You know, it sounds stupid, but I got to do this by making my mistakes everywhere else first and learning. Make your mistakes and then gradually you will, you know, and it, you should be doing, you should say yes to everything. That corporate movie that you just, uh, somebody said, you know, this, this, we're going to show you how to use cleaning spray, say yes. Because the guy who's directing the corporate movie may end up being Ridley Scott. So mm -hmm. the first thing is always say yes. The second thing is expect to earn nothing for 10 years. Um, because that's about roughly what it is. So you need to have the dedication to get through that difficult period of the first 10 years of your career where you will earn close to nothing. Um, and have the, in my case, I think is the other last thing I would say is you have to have the hide of a buffalo. That rejection maybe sometimes feel very personal. Um, and it's music is a very, very personal thing too. So whether somebody likes your music or not is not a reflection on you, it's a reflection on their taste. And that sometimes you have to carry, but then you learn the lessons from what happened there. So don't make the same mistakes twice. That's my last thing. Hey, and uh, do you have, finally, do you have any uh, upcoming projects that you're able to talk about? Or are you signed up to do the other Avatar movies? I have, uh, I have these, uh, I have these uh, boutique um, uh, indie films, Avatar 3, Avatar 4, Avatar 5 to do. Um, and there are some other things. I'm actually going to take a little break because I have, uh, I finished this film, it is what, November the, December the 15th. And um, we delivered the film on December the 1st. I delivered my last cue on November the 23rd. I caught COVID on November the 24th. <laughs> so, um, so I could do with some time off. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> Been busy. Well, yeah. uh, again, I want to thank you so much for uh, for allowing us to talk to you. It's been a real pleasure. Real and en really enjoy it, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, oh, very much so. Endeavors. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and and uh, I hope everybody enjoys the film and also the score if they get to listen to it as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to see the movie uh, at midnight tonight, and then next week with some friends. And, uh, I look forward to hearing from you what you think. I will, I'll let you know. <laughs> hey, great. have a good night. And you too. Good night.